We're currently in Matthew 24, so turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24. And Jesus has been teaching. He's been discipling his disciples, the twelve, about the final seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. We left off with Jesus quoting from the book of Daniel. He tells them in Daniel chapter 24, verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Once again, the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist will go into the rebuilt temple that the Antichrist is going to allow the Jews to build. And he's going to sign this peace treaty with the, the Jews. That's what Matthew 9, 24 to 27 is all about. Once he signs this peace treaty with the Jews, it allows them to rebuild their temple. The signing of that treaty is the beginning of the seven years of great tribulation. It's not the rapture. The rapture happens first. And then whenever that peace treaty is signed, I think pretty quick, um, then they will rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. But the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation, is he goes into that rebuilt temple and says, Worship me, I'm God. And we saw last time Paul speaks of this in 2 Thessalonians 2, Verses 3 and 4, that's exactly what the son of perdition, the, the lawless one, the Antichrist does. He goes into that temple and, and demands to be worshipped as God. And Jesus says, when you see that, so he's speaking into our future still because it hasn't happened yet. It didn't happen in 70 AD. The preterists believe all prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD. If that's the case, I'm really disappointed if we're in the you know millennial reign of Christ. This is a bummer. We're not in the millennial reign of Christ, so I, I discount preterism. But be that as it may, when he goes into the temple, he demands to be worshipped as God. And Jesus says, when you see that, you know, you Jews, because he's talking about those in Judea, flee. Don't even go into your house. Get out of there quickly. He says, pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath. He's referring to Jews. You see this happening in the Jewish temple there in Jerusalem. And so they are to flee because the Antichrist at that time is going to try to destroy the Jewish people. And we're told in Zechariah 13, we looked at this verse last week, uh, Zechariah 13, 8, that he will destroy two-thirds of the Jews that are there. One third will escape, and it says they go into the wilderness where God will protect them so that one third of the Jews will make it through the great tribulation time. Two thirds will not. So the abomination of desolation that Jesus warns the Jews about, it takes place right in the middle of that final seven year period. So three and a half years into it. And we'll look at this again next week, too. We're going to talk a lot about the rapture next time. But... In Revelation, it says 1,260 days. That equals three and a half years. He talks about, uh, Revelation says 42 months, three and a half years. He says time, time, half a time. That's three and a half years. And so right in the middle of the great tribulation is the abomination of desolation. And what has already been a very horrific time of judgment in the first three and a half years gets even worse after the, the midway point. In fact, the book of Revelation confirms what Jesus said. And we left off in verse 22 last time where Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, talking about the great tribulation, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Again, the word for saved there is sozo. It means to be delivered. It means to be rescued. It means to be preserved, protected. So unless those days were you know, shortened, no flesh would be protected. In other words, unless Jesus came back when he does come back at the end of the Great Tribulation, that's what brings it to an end, his second coming, unless he came back when he does, nothing would survive all the judgment and wrath and everything that's going on on planet Earth. I mean, we have God's wrath being poured out. Satan and the demons are let loose. They have very little restraints upon them. We have the Battle of Armageddon taking place in Revelation 16. 
And, and although governments of the world are gathered, all the armies to fight against each other, it's going to be brutal. So unless Jesus came back when he does, nobody, nothing would survive. Notice also what Jesus says at the end of verse 22, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, the big question is, who are the elect that he's referring to? Christians, and there are a lot of believers believe that, you know, we're going to go through the Great Tribulation. And they use this verse to try to say we're going to go through the Great Tribulation because unless those days were shortened, nobody would be saved. But for the elect's sake, and they look at the elect as Christians, are Christians the elect? Yes. Are Christians always the only one that called the elect? No. God also calls Jews his elect. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 4. It says, you can look it on the screen, you can write it down. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you though you have not known me. He says the same thing in Isaiah 65, verse 9, also in 65, verse 22. They're, they are the elect. Paul calls the Jews the elect as well in the New Testament. Remember in Romans 9, 10, 11, it's dealing with the Jewish people. And in Romans eleven twenty eight, 28, Paul writes, Concerning the gospel, they, speaking of the Jews, are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. So in context here, when, with Jesus speaking about the Antichrist defiling the Jewish temple, when, and, and Jesus saying to the Jews, when you see this, get out of Jerusalem, get out of Judea, pray that it's not on the Sabbath. These are all referring to Jewish things. He's talking to the Jewish people. So now as the remnant of Jews are safely tucked away, um, they're being protected by the Lord in the wilderness. Jesus gives this warning to those Jews during the Great Tribulation, verses 23 through 25. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect, again, speaking of the Jews here. See, I have told you beforehand. Now, this is an important warning for God's people at all times. We saw in the beginning of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus was warning the 12 apostles, be aware of false teachers and false prophets. And then he says to those living during the signs of the times like we're in today, beware of false teachers, false prophets. And this is the third time he says, beware of false teachers and false uh, apostles and prophets. So this is the third mention of this. Satan is the one who is behind lying signs and wonders. He has tremendous powers, but he is a liar and a deceiver. And so how do we combat his lies? Well, it's always been stand on the truth of God's word. Hold fast to the promises of God's word. Build your foundation on G Well, he's the foundation. Build your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the word of God. We must pass everything so-called apostles and prophets tell us, even pastors and teachers. I'm not the final authority. God's word is. But we, everything has to pass through the filter of God's word. If it doesn't pass the test of God's word, do not listen to them. Do not support them. Don't point people to them. Again, Satan is behind them, and he is using them to turn people away from the Lord. This is what Satan has always done. Twist God's word. He did it in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, with Eve. He's, oh, surely you won't die. You'll be just like God. That's the lie of Satan. Again, he is behind these things. The climax of Satan's lying signs and wonders will take place during the seven-year Great Tribulation time. Satan will fully possess the Antichrist. In Revelation 13, it tells us that Satan himself gives all of his power and authority to the Antichrist during this time. He will perform many lying signs and wonders. The Apostle Paul tells us that after the restrainer is removed, and I believe the restrainer is the Holy Spirit working through the body of Christ in 2 Thessalonians 2, when the restrainer is removed, then the Antichrist is revealed 
And as we saw last time, the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit-filled church is taken up at the rapture, the Antichrist steps onto the scene. And this is what Paul says about the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2, it's on the screen here, verse 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Again, the lie is you can become a God without Jesus. You can become a God on your own, or you are equal to God. You're equal to Jesus. You know, the Mormons believe that they're going to be a, a God on their own planet with their celestial wives, just like Jesus has many wives. He's on his own planet, blah, blah, blah. So that's the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in in unrighteousness. Strong delusion. Earlier we saw when we started Matthew 24, Jesus said these are the beginning of birth pangs. When you see wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, all these things, earthquakes increasing. And, and we talked about how there's always been these things, but in the last days these things really start to ramp up in frequency and in intensity. And he says these are the beginning of birth pangs. All you moms know when you go into labor, you're not going to stop it. It's going to get more intense, more severe, until you deliver the baby. That's just the way God designed it. And so he says, when you see these things, like we're seeing in the world now, all these things, earthquakes, back in 1890 to 1900, remember I mentioned, I went through the whole list of every 10 years, and it was like one you know, major earthquake that killed anybody. Then it was like two. Then it was like three. Then it was like four, real low for a long time. And then the last... 40 years, it's gone up 65, 150. Now it's over 200 a year. They're, you know, massive earthquakes. So it's really ramping things up. We're seeing strong delusion, just the birth pangs of it now. I mean, how many people today are just so, they're just blinded to the simple truth of God's word. They're, they're blinded by their devotion to what they believe is science. Believe science. Well, I believe science when it's really scientific. <laughs> I don't believe what they believe science. Um, okay, there's 93 genders. No, God said he made them male and female. There's only two. Believe science. Men can have babies. No, they can't. That's not science. I mean, so get people to define their terms because strong delusion is coming, but it's going to be so much worse during the Great Tribulation. Did I finish that verse? I guess so. They all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So Satan is more than willing to use lying signs and wonders to keep people from coming to Jesus Christ for salvation. And people who crave signs and wonders. God is a wonderful God. He does miracles. He does all kinds of amazing things above and beyond all that we can hope and imagine. But when you start craving signs and wonders, you got to be careful because people are very susceptible to anything that looks spiritual. Satan does a lot of spiritual stuff that might look good on the outside, but again, he always takes people away from the Lord, away from the word of God. We've already seen the religious leaders come to Jesus twice and demand that they, Jesus, we want you to give us a sign. Okay, I've healed the sick. I've cleansed lepers. I've opened blind eyes, deaf ears. I've raised a few people from the dead at that point. And you want me to show you a sign and a wonder. Now, what they're specifically asking him to do, and we talked about this when we saw the second time they mentioned, we want to see a sign from you, a wonder. They looked at Elijah as one who was of God, and he was, because he called fire down from heaven. That was the sign, fire coming down from heaven. They looked at Moses as one of God's prophets. He brought fire down from heaven. Neither one of those guys brought anything down from heaven. God used them, and God brought the fire down from heaven. That's the point. 
God can do what he wants, how he wants, through whomever he wants, but they are demanding Jesus. We want, that's what they want. We want to see fire come down from heaven. Jesus tells them, and an evil and an adulterous generation craves after signs and wonders. I've known a lot of people over the years, and they're always wanting to follow the Holy Spirit, wherever the Holy Spirit's moving. And a lot of times, it's not the Holy Spirit. Back in the day, there was a lot of people that were barking like dogs in church, crowing like roosters. That's the Holy Spirit moving. It's like, no, that's kind of demonic. That's not of the Lord. I mean, it has to follow in, follow, fall in line with the word of God. But Jesus says, no. One sign I'll show you, the sign of Jonah the prophet. He was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So he believed that whale of a story, right? And the Son of Man is going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's a sign. The resurrection is the ultimate sign. So look at... Revelation 13, because the Antichrist is going to do a lot of signs and wonders. He's got a right-hand man that's going to help him do a lot of signs and wonders, known as the false prophet or the second beast. And this is why so many people are going to follow the Antichrist, the false prophet. He says, it says here, he performs great signs so that he, he even makes fire come down from heaven. For a lot of people, that was the sign that God is working. But this is the Antichrist. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Again, the Antichrist. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So that's one of the signs. He'll look dead, but it'll come back to life. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. With modern technology and all the AI stuff going on, I mean, we're going to do the book of Revelation after we finish Matthew. There's so many things that are happening around us. This whole economic global forum thing of Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab and the rest of these guys, I'll be nice. Are, the things they talk about, though, they're trying to get total control of every human being on planet Earth. I mean, it all lines up with what they're saying here in Revelation. It's just incredible. But he'll give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads that no one may, be, um, may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who under, uh, has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For is the number of a man, his number is 666. So we'll look into that later, uh, well, in Revelation. But he's got some kind of mark he's going to put on people. I remember, I don't know if any of you are old enough or saved long enough, when the movie, uh, ah, what's it called? Thief in the Night. It was one of the first Christian movies and it's about the rapture and the people left behind and they're getting, and that's right when the, the uh, scanning codes came out in grocery stores. And so everybody had like this big scanning bar on their, you know, and across their forehead, you know, and that was a big thing back then. The technology is so amazing today. And there are a lot of people in different countries that are getting things put under their right hand. They can just boop, all this electronic stuff. That's not the mark of the beast. This guy will put implement it, but it's just showing us how close we're getting to all these things happening. Birth pangs that we're seeing today. So anyway, these two men, the Antichrist, the false prophet, are going to have tremendous satanic powers, but this is nothing new for Satan. He has used his powers to, de uh, to deceive, to steal, kill, destroy. That's what Satan has always wanted to do. That's why we stay close to Jesus. He came to give us life that more abundantly. So here's a great verse that I encourage you to underline, circle in your Bible. Moses giving us this very important warning to the Israelites. It's in Deuteronomy 13, starting in verse 1. He says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and notice, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass. In other words, it looks like a legitimate miracle took place of which he spoke to you, and this is why you need the word of God as the final authority. 
because this is what he does. He does the sign of wonder, and then he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known. And this guy will say, let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Isn't that what Jesus said earlier? That's the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments. Obey His voice. It's all going back to you. Holding on to the Word of God. That's the final authority. Not because somebody can do some amazing whatever it is they're doing. You shall serve Him. Talking about the Lord. Hold fast to Him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. Again, these same principles apply to the Lord's church today. Throughout the New Testament, we have many, many warnings about lying signs and wonders, false teachers, false apostles. They appear to be servants of God, but in reality, they're just men and women working for Satan. This is what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. God didn't call them to be apostles. They're transforming themselves into apostles. They, they, make this, they take this title for themselves. And he says, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. I encourage all of you, when you get home at some point this week, read 2 Peter chapter 2, because the whole chapter deals with false teachers, false prophets. They try to make merchandise of you. That's one of the ways you know they are shysters, is they're going after your money. And there's a lot of places out there. They just constantly are begging for money. And they, they, you know, the whole name it and claim it thing, it's, it's about your material blessings rather than being satisfied with Christ. Be that as it may, the way we are victorious, the way we overcome Satan's lies is to stand upon the truth of God's word, keep setting our minds on things above where Christ is seated, not on the things of this earth. Continue to build your life upon the solid rock foundation of Jesus. And heed the warning signs that are found throughout God's word. After all, as Jesus just told us here in verse 25, see, I have told you beforehand. So we shouldn't be surprised by what we're seeing in these last days. And this is even more important to recognize today because Satan is not slowing down. He's not like, yeah, okay, we're getting to the end. I'll just kick back. No, Satan, I think, is ramping things up. And we know during the Great Tribulation time, we'll see in, in Revelation, I think it's in 12, it says he knows he has but little time left. So he's really going to ramp things up. And he doesn't uh, care who he destroys. He wants to destroy as many people as possible. So for you and I, what do we need to do? Put on the whole armor of God. Walk in the truth of God's word. Stay in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, put off the deeds of the flesh. Basic, you know, Christianity 101. Look at verse 26. And by the way, we're not getting through the whole chapter today. If you're starting to worry, it's like, oh my gosh, this guy just won't shut up. He just keeps going on and on and on. So verse 26 says, Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. Again, when Christ returns at a second coming, every eye will see him, we're told. He's coming in power and great glory. It's going to be amazing. Now, something to keep in mind here, he's not going to be out in the desert somewhere. He's not going to be in some in, you know, hidden inner chamber somewhere. It's interesting that's one of the interesting things, because I used to study the cults a lot, and Jehovah's Witnesses were notorious for setting dates when Christ is coming back. 1914, that was the first date. 1918, 
They were adamant. They had all these publications. This is the year. 1925, he's coming back. 1975 was the last time they set a date. Jesus didn't come back. So what they figured is their founder, Charles Taze Russell, was correct because he's the one that first said 1914, that he is coming back to earth in 1914. And they believe Jesus did come back to earth in 1914, spiritually. And he's been dwelling since 1914 in their headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> no, they truly believe that. That's why they think everything they publish is the word of God. They think they're being led by Jesus Christ dwelling in their headquarters spiritually in Brooklyn. Ah, if I was Jesus, I'd choose a different place, but whatever. I mean, this is just weird. So according to his words here, Jesus says, if they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Why? Because, again, when he comes back, everybody's going to see him. It's going to be glorious. He's going to light up the, the heavens when he comes back. Look at verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Forever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. This scene is illuminated in the book of Revelation as Jesus comes through the door in heaven, says he's riding upon a white horse. And he, it's just going to be brilliant, you know, radiant. I don't know how you describe the glory of the Lord when he comes in his power. And we're going to be coming back with him, according to Revelation 19. As he comes back, we follow him on white horses. And we're all dressed, it says, in fine linen, bright and clean. And so it looks like just billows of cloud, billions of saints and angels coming back behind Jesus. He does all the work, all the fighting. We just follow him. That's how every eye will see him when he comes back. In Matthew, uh, or in Revelation 19, it says, you know, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, and he strikes the nations. That's the word of God. Look at this verse in Revelation 19, verse 17. The Apostle John tells us what he sees next. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. That's what Jesus says here in verse 28. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So the birds are going to feast upon, because it tells us there in you know, Revelation 19, the kings, the leaders, the authorities, the poor people, anybody that was you know, enemies of God are going to be wiped out, and all the birds of the earth are going to feast upon their carcasses. This is wonderful before lunchtime. And I like to joke, sorry, I wonder if the birds are going to say, tastes like chicken. No, they won't. Anyway, Jesus now goes into a little more detail about his second coming. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, so the seven years are ending, and it ends with him coming back. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So how is the great tribulation brought to an end? The second coming of Christ. Once again, this world's going to be on the brink of annihilation. God's wrath being poured out. Satan and the demons let loose. The battle of Armageddon taking place. The nation of Israel's is tucked away, and I have a place I believe God's going to tuck them away in Moab. We know it's in Moab. Petra is in Moab. Selah, we're told, is also named for rock. Petra means rock. So possibly that remnant of Jews will be spared, saved, protected in the ancient city of Petra. And when Christ returns, everyone on planet Earth will see him. Notice Jesus says, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. That lines up with Revelation 1.7. It says, behold, he is coming with clouds. That's all of us coming with him. And every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. 
Same, that's the same thing Zechariah 12.10 mentions, you know, that the Jews will mourn for him when they see him as a mother mourns for her only son. And they will recognize at that moment, this is, he was, he is, he always shall be our Messiah, Jesus. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. So Jesus is not hiding out in a cave somewhere. He's not spiritually ruling and reigning from some inner chamber in Brooklyn. When he returns, everyone will know for sure it's the Lord. There's no question about this. Every eye will see him. So the picture, you know, here is Jesus riding upon this white horse. His glory is radiating. Billions of saints are following. Revelation 19, verse 14 says, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. This is what he's referring to, coming in the clouds. The first stop he makes when he comes down is to an ancient city called Basra. And it just so happens to be a few miles outside of Petra. And he doesn't set foot on planet Earth until he gets to the Mount of Olives. But I believe, again, this is where the Jewish people could be protected by the Lord during this time. Look at these verses in Isaiah 63, starting in verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Then the question is asked of the Messiah. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the winepress? Here's his answer. I have trodden the winepress alone. Uh, again, he does all the battling, all the fighting. We're just following him and from the peoples no one was with me for i have trodden them in my anger trampled them in my fury their blood is sprinkled upon my garments that's the same thing that uh, revelation 19 says when he returns he's got splattered blood all over his robes um, their blood is sprinkled upon my garments i have stained all my robes for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come and that refers to the redemption of the Jews who now recognize Jesus is their Messiah. From Basra, as you follow this out, he goes to Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo. When we go to Israel, we're always there at the Valley of Megiddo. It's pretty amazing. That's where the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place. And he brings that battle to an end because all the armies that are fighting against each other are going to turn on Jesus and he's going to wipe him out. Then he travels a short distance, and this is the first time he puts his feet back on planet Earth. It's on the Mount of Olives. And, and this is what we're familiar with, Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. I believe that's referring to Armageddon as he fights in the day of battle. In that day, so he's going to do that, and in the same day, he sets his feet. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall, be move, uh, shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now, it's interesting. About 50 years, maybe 60 years ago now, the Sheraton Hotels, they wanted to build a hotel on the Mount of Olives, and they were required to do environmental impact study. And as they're you know, doing all this, they discovered there's a fault line running on the Mount of Olives. They could have saved themselves a lot of money. Just read Zechariah. It was written 2,500 years ago. They wouldn't have had to go through that because Zechariah talks about it. It's going to be split in two from north to south. There's going to be this big valley. It goes from east to west. Anyway, Ezekiel 47 mentions this same large valley that will flow. Actually, water is going to gush up there in Jerusalem. It's going to flow because Jerusalem is dry. The water's going to gush up there, and it's going to flow to the west of the Mediterranean Sea. Also, a river's going to flow down east and go into the Dead Sea. And, and I encourage you to read through Ze uh, Ezekiel 40 through 47. It talks about life coming back to the Dead Sea. People are going to be fishing in the Dead Sea. If you've been there, you know there's nothing alive there. 
It's totally dead, but it's going to come back to life. And it's going to be during the millennial reign of Christ. It's going to be glorious. So this is why the second coming of Jesus is so amazing. He's going to establish his kingdom on earth. He's going to rule and reign for 1,000 years. He is going to put an end to all the wickedness, all the corruption, all the world rulers, all the governments of this fallen world. He'll you know, wipe it all out. No more wars for 1,000 years. No more sicknesses, no more diseases, no more hunger, no more suffering. Mankind is trying all they can to fix everything. They can't fix it. We're broken. And it's going to get worse and worse in these last days. But Jesus is the one who's going to turn this devastated planet into a Garden of Eden-like paradise. This will be the time when the nations will turn their weapons into implements of agriculture this will be the time when the lion lies down with the lamb. The deserts will bloom like well-watered gardens. Can you imagine a world where there's no more crime, no more shootings? It's like Chicago every weekend. It's like 20, 30 shootings. Six, seven, eight people killed every week. Just in Chicago. I mean, we're, it's in a free fall in our nation. But when Jesus returns... Look at Isaiah 11, verse 9. It says of this glorious time, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow, that's going to be amazing. One of the most amazing things to me, Jesus ruling and reigning, and he's promised his bride that we are going to rule and reign with him. Can you imagine such a thing? I can hardly wait. We'll be in our resurrection bodies. I can hardly wait for that. Because this old body is wearing out. You know, Paul says, these bodies is like a tent. He's preparing a place like a mansion for us in glory. These are like tents. This thing's starting to flap in the wind. The zipper's broken. I mean, it's falling apart. But we're going to be up there, our resurrection bodies, we come back with him, we're going to be ruling and reigning with him in our resurrection bodies. I can't wait. Again, at the second coming of Christ, everybody will see him, nothing hidden, no secret. It's not a quiet, obscure appearance of Christ, but he's coming back in power and great glory. When we, next week, when we talk about the rapture, that's a whole different scenario, as we'll see. Look at verse 31. And he, will, uh, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Um, this corresponds with what we just saw in Isaiah 11, wolf lying down with the lamb. You know, the little kid will play by the cobra's hole, the viper's nest, and won't be hurt. You know, pull out a little rattlesnake. <laughs> And they'll be buddies. You know, it's going to be amazing during the millennial reign of Christ. Isaiah 11, verse 12, we're told what the Lord will do with all the Jews who were scattered. Again, they're scattered throughout the world because Jews in Israel, they'll flee to the wilderness. But there's Jews all over the world that will make it through the great tribulation. So it says in Isaiah 11, verse 12, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And so these angels will gather up all these outcast Jews, bring them back home to Israel. Now Jesus gives us a hint of the timing of all these things in the last days. Verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. In other words, summer is right around the corner. You see the fig tree, the leaves are on it. What is the fig tree? It's the symbol of Israel. It's referred to as the symbol of Israel. Back in chapter 21, Jesus cursed the fig tree. He got to it. There's leaves on it, no fruit. He cursed it. It was symbolic of the Jews rejecting him. He was hoping to find fruit in Israel. They said, crucify him. You know, this is the week before, you know, a couple days before he's crucified here in this chapter. They're going to have Barabbas on stage, Jesus on stage. Pontius Pilate says, who do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, what's his name mean? Bar, son of Abba, the father. Barabbas. 
You want me to release you Barabbas, son of the father, or Jesus, son of the father? They want Barabbas because that's their version of the Savior, the Messiah. He's going to come. He's going to wipe out the Romans. He's going to establish his kingdom. Barabbas was a rebel. He was fighting against the Romans. That's what they wanted. They didn't want Jesus, the son of the father. Be that as it may, they all come back here and they reject him, reject Jesus at this time. The Old Testament prophets refer to Israel as a fig tree. Uh, Jeremiah 24, he talks about the basket of good figs, the basket of bad figs. It's all about Israel. Hosea 9.10, Joel 1.7, to name a few. So the context here is Jesus says, learn this parable of the fig tree. When its branch is tender and it's putting forth its leaves, the end is near is what it's referring to. I believe this prophecy speaks of the rebirth of the nation of Israel. After 1,900 years being dispersed from Israel, 70 AD, they get kicked out. The Romans wipe them out. 163 AD, they're totally destroyed and pushed out. 1948, May 14th, 1948, in one day, they're back as a nation. Somebody says in Isaiah 66, 8, well, it's, it's God. God asks a question, shall a nation be born at once? The answer is yes. With God, all things are possible. Psalm 102, look at this verse, verse 16. For the Lord shall build up Zion. It literally means when the Lord builds up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. God has been building up Zion for the last, what, 75 years now there in Israel. The land that was once barren and desolate produces abundance, fruits, vegetables, flowers. They export all over the world. It's amazing. Three-fourths of all the Nobel, Peace, or Nobel Prizes in science, math, has gone to the Jews. Brilliant people. This is why Satan hates them so much. He wants to destroy them. But God has kept and will keep his promise to his chosen people in the last days. Verse 33, Jesus says, So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. Doors. James 5 9 says, Know that the judge is near at the doors. Jesus. When you see all these things, know that it's close to Jesus coming back. At the right time, when the world is on the brink of annihilation, Jesus is going to return. Revelation 19, 11, now I say heaven, now I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And the rest of the chapter speaks of his glorious return. Finally, verses 34 and 35, Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away so don't put all your hope in a new green deal it's, it's no literally great great tribulation is going to pretty much wipe out everything man's trying to protect here and at the end of the millennial reign of christ guess what god does because he's god and he can do what he wants he's going to vaporize the entire universe including planet earth and then he's going to create a whole new heaven universe and a whole new earth in which righteousness will dwell. Only God can do that, and he will do that. So heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So Jesus gives us his word, his guarantee, that all these things are going to happen in the last days. And for these things to happen, Israel had to be reborn as a nation. For the abomination of desolation to occur, occur there has to be a temple built on the Temple Mounts. And that's what they're planning. When we go to Jerusalem, sometimes we go to the Temple Institute, and they're the ones that have made every garment, everything. They got the menorah. They got it all ready to go. They're just waiting for the go-ahead. And that's what their hope is, to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. It won't take very long at all. Jerusalem had to be restored to Israel. It had to be. Because it's only in the last days that Jerusalem will become a cup of trembling to the whole world. It wasn't a cup of trembling in 70 AD. The Romans just wiped it out. But today, 
It's a cup of trembling. The, the world despises Israel. They despise Jerusalem. I mean, look at the flack Trump got because he moved the capital from Tel Aviv, or the, not the capital, the um, embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. We were there right after it happened, and they're all excited because somebody recognized Jerusalem as our capital, and it is. It's God's capital. Anyway, Israel is the sign that we are living in the last days. Without the rebirth of Israel, all these things concerning the last days makes no sense. This is why if you study... Um, you know, different theologians, uh, commentators from 100 years ago, 200, 300 years ago, it made no sense because they thought Israel's done. They're not coming back. It looked impossible. But God brought them back just as he said he would. Israel is the sign. Without the rebirth of Israel, these prophecies would make no sense. So he says this generation will by no means pass away. So what generation is he talking about? Is he referring to a generation of years? Because the Bible says a generation is 38 years. Another place it says it's 40 years. God says that the Israelites spent four generations in Egypt, 400 years. So is that 100 years is a generation? The word that he uses for generation here means a people group. In other words, he's talking about and I believe Jesus is saying that the generation of Jews living at the time when the clock restarts for the nation of Israel, when they sign that peace treaty with the Antichrist, that 70th week of Daniel begins, that group of people are going to witness the direct hand of God upon them in awesome and incredible ways. And we have God's word on it, and he will fulfill everything he has promised. 